great, wonderful. Thanks, thanks a lot, Adam. Um, and um, depending on where you are today, good morning, well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our um, webinar webinar about the uh, inflection point for the automotive supplier industry. Um, so I'm I'm Tom Went, and I'm a partner in our San Francisco office, co-leading our efforts in auto tech and the supplier space. And I'm pleased to be joined today by my partner, Mark Gottfriedson, who is co-leading our auto practice in the Americas. Um, but before we get started with the formal presentation, um, on behalf of Bain and Company, uh, we hope that you, your families, and, and all your colleagues are all safe and, and healthy during these difficult times. Uh, and we offer our thoughts and condolences to those who have been personally impacted by all what's going on out there in this moment. So, um, these are certainly extraordinary times we live in, uh, especially for the automotive and, and the supplier industry. Um, but we believe that despite all the turbulences and anxiety they are causing, these are also times which offer a unique opportunity to really step back and, and take a fresh look at our business. So with this in mind, we hope that we can leave you today with the following four messages. Um, uh, first, there's obviously a lot of uncertainty uh, ongoing right now, uh, specifically in our industry, and nobody has uh, the real crystal ball to predict the post-cycle new normal re reliably. But what we know is that consumer confidence will remain low for the foreseeable future and that the underlying fundamental trends in the industry are not going away either. And this makes us believe that we will probably not see a quick recovery, but instead have to get comfortable with a sustained downturn in the industry over multiple multiple years. Um, second, uh, unfortunately, we believe the worst is yet to come for the industry. And our analysis shows that already today, a considerable portion of the supply base is not really ready for a recession. Um, ever increasing cost pressure from OEMs and continuous COVID disruptions will probably send the industry into a even severe, even more severe crisis. Um, but on the good side, third, uh, we have seen an earlier downturn that those are also the times where the biggest market share shifts happen. And therefore, fourth, we believe that the industry is really at a critical inflection point and that it requires some tough choices to balance the viability of your portfolio today with the inevitable budget cuts everybody is facing right now. And uh, we really hope that we can show you today how we can ideally navigate those in a, in a successful way. So if you move on, um, uh, you know, starting with this slide, the impact of the current crisis on the industry is, is certainly significant with global sales volumes down by about 24% this year based on our forecasts and maybe even more. If you run the numbers, this will on average take out about 80% of the industry's profitability in 2020 alone, uh, not speaking about the years to come. We understand that most companies uh, have so far been very consumed with managing the immediate fallout and, and implementing rigid cash management measures. Um, but you know, through, through the discussions with our clients, um, and as we move further along now, we believe that we need to really quickly enter into a next phase of our COVID response and start thinking about kind of deeper structural changes to make those cuts, those, those you know, momentary cuts sustainable, but also about how we are balancing the ongoing budget constraints with the imminent need to keep investing or even doubling down on new opportunities and technologies and innovation when it comes to an autonomous connected electric shared mobility future. Um, and and this, this balance act is certainly not trivial and requires us to form kind of a point of view, not only about the duration and, and the depth of this crisis, but also about how the new normal on the other side will really look like. And, and this is what you know, we have tried to do over the last several months uh, since we are um, in this crisis here. And, and I want to briefly guide you through our, our insights here. So now when we are trying to understand the full extent of this crisis and, and potential recovery scenarios, um, you always have to start with the end customer. And even though if we are now getting our factories up and running again, it doesn't really help when the underlying demand is not supporting this. And uh, yes, there, there will be certainly um, a near time boost to restock inventory, which the supplier base is, is also feeling, um, especially in the US where, where inventory is down about 1.5 million um, from a year ago, and which is leading to, to kind of 
you know, interesting situations if you go out there and, and want to buy a car. Um, you know, the majority of dealers are actually are asking for, for markups on, on, on MSRP today. Um, but what we really want to understand is how long the tail is to really claw back to, to pre-crisis levels. Right? And that's why since the beginning um, of, of the situation here, we have tried to understand how consumer confidence is developing and have conducted bi-weekly surveys uh, on a global basis. <clears throat> and what this tells us is that demand will probably not recover in the short term. Uh, we see on this slide here that consumer confidence in, in their income security remains very low in all regions, especially in the US and China, um, which is surprising given China is, is further ahead in, in their recovery. And it also shows that consumers are expecting to considerably lower their private consumption in, in the US by, by almost 50%. Um, moving on to the next slide here, um, uh, as a result of, of, of this situation, buyers are, to, to no surprise, I guess, increasingly continuing to postpone their car purchase plans. 63% um, of respondents in the US who plan to buy a vehicle this year said they will postpone their purchase, and, and most of them by, by more than six months, actually. If you look at China, um, the percentage there is, is even higher with almost 80% postponing their car purchase, which puts a quick recovery there as many have predicted and are hoping for um, in addition to the question, I guess. Um, interesting is also on the right side um, of the slide here, the reasons why people are postponing and obviously unsurprisingly consumers in the US mostly state unemployment and, and job insecurity. Whereas I would argue the, the more rational Germans are waiting for falling prices. <clears throat> On the other side, um, Chinese consumers mostly mentioned that they believe it's socially inappropriate to buy a new car right now, which might yet be another sign um, that we won't see demand recover there as quickly as, as we all hoped. So looking at all this research and, and the expected economic impact of a, of a potential recession, um, we believe that we can't trust on a quick recovery but have to really plan with a sustained downturn over multiple years. And our internal and proprietary forecast shows, especially North America and Europe with significant down volumes into 2023 and, and even beyond. But as I said before, nobody really has the crystal ball right now. And, and those numbers could eventually even be worth um, and really depend on, on many factors from infection outbreaks and, and you know, renewed containment cycles over, over supply chain disruptions um, up to governance stimulus programs and uh, increasing demand volatility uh, on the consumer side. Right? But what it really shows us is that we have to shift um, to a different way of planning and, and, and budgeting. We have to shift to a scenario-based planning approach and, you know, have to develop the agility to quickly respond to any new scenario as it, as it evolves. So what makes the current situation even more complex is the fact that underlying fundamental trends in the industry are, are here to stay and are not going away um, through this crisis, um, but instead probably dampen the potential recovery and, and drag it out even further. Uh, so, for example, the high double digit growth rates in China, which have been boosting the industry for so long, um, will not return. Europe will continue with their strict emission regulation and will put policies in place that require the industry to really considerably increase investments into clean air vehicles. And in the US, on the other side, um, as we see here on the left side of the slide, um, we see that the demographically implied structural demand is already 25% below 2018 sales volume. So we're talking about 4 million um, cars, which are more in the market than structurally implied. And with the growth of driving age population here in, in the US um, now approaching net zero, it's likely that any potential recovery um, will be dampened here as well, even though if we're getting out of this crisis. Um, and then last not least, adding to this perfect storm, um, the trend towards autonomous connected electric and shared mobility um, is here to stay as well. And, and we believe that most of those, those trends um, are even accelerating during this crisis. I mean, for sure there, we'll probably see some, some initial concern when it comes to sharing, um, but we are expecting increased government incentives, regulation, and even customer demand to further push vehicle electrification, especially in, in, in Europe and, and in China, where we are already seeing 
uh, big government incentive programs going on um, pushing pure electric vehicles. Um, at the same time, connected and, and all the digital solutions along the entire customer journey will see a steeper adoption since people will a spend more time in their cars and and then also most touch points along along the customer journey will will just be digital right and um, oems and dealers are, are all shifting towards um, an online uh, experience uh, with with their with their customers um, on the autonomous side, um, I think we are already seeing the start of, I, I would argue, healthy consolidation in, in the startup and tech world, which will effectively help to accelerate the development, especially in the US and China. Europe might run the risk here to, to fall further behind uh, because most OEMs and suppliers there are reducing their exposure given the current situation, as we have seen with, with the recent examples um, and, and announcements. So, you know, if if we look at, at this slide here, <clears throat> I think, in fact, this turns um, actually out to be really this critical inflection point for, for the traditional players in the industry um, in their race to as a leading position in, in technology and innovation, actually. Um, especially since deep pocketed tech players are actively using this opportunity now to double down their efforts and, and outspend legacy players as those are cutting back and um, sitting at the sideline, basically. Yeah. We have all seen the recent announcement of Intel buying MoveIt, um, Waymo, and, and just recently Rivian um, raising huge uh, external rounds, and Amazon buying Sooks. And I think buying Sooks with a, with a much bigger ambition than just thinking about autonomous package delivery. Right? So I think they, will, they want to play a much, much bigger role in the entire new mobility ecosystem. <clears throat> So, uh, you know, long, long story short, if, if OEMs and, and suppliers don't want to sit at the sideline, uh, <clears throat> we believe they have to aggressively continue their investments in future technologies, um, which it in itself presents them with some really tough choices about where to free up funding in their core business or in other areas um, to keep investing in those new businesses and, and, and innovation activities. And, and I think this is, this is the point where um, many are asking themselves what are what are interesting models, what are potential models uh, one could apply um, to really balance the risk here while uh, you know keeping the foot on the gas pedal and and, and continue investing um, in innovation and new technology. Um, having said all this, um, unfortunately, we believe the worst is yet to come for the industry. Um, both OEMs and suppliers have obviously been hit hard in the first quarter and the second quarter with profitability down 50, 60 percent year over year. And, you know, a sustained downturn over multiple years, as we have just seen before, um, driven by the current pandemic. Um, secondly, a, a dampening recovery given the underlying structural trends uh, we have just talked about. Um, and the ongoing need to continue investments into future technologies will really put OEMs into an increasingly tough spot and, and we can expect them to continue doing what they have always been doing and which is to, to pass on the pressure down, down the value chain, which, which is then obviously hitting the supplier space um, uh, extremely hard. Um, so what we have done here and what this slide shows actually is we wanted to get an understanding about, um, you know, the, the health of, of the current industry and the supply base. And we have run an analysis of the top US suppliers and, and have simulated basically their P&L and balance sheets based on our prolonged downturn scenario, which I, I have showed you earlier, actually. Um, and the results are not pretty. 35% um, of US suppliers are not recession ready with 2020 net debt to EBTA ratios reaching above four. And if we would model a deep recession scenario with a longer lockdown periods or continuous lockdown periods as we are starting to see now in the US um, and an economic recession similar to the 2008 and 2009 crisis, the number even increases to 60% of US suppliers not being recession ready. Um, so in other words, we are indeed at a very critical point for the whole industry. And we believe that our actions now are very important and will determine how we are getting out of this. Um, with this, I would like to hand over to Mark, uh, who will guide us through a playbook for the supplier industry specifically, which we have implemented with many of our clients and which we believe works very well in, in, 
in this situation. Um, Mark, you can take it away. Thank you, Tom. Well, you've gotten all the bad news from Tom. Hopefully I will be able to turn this that is an inflection point from, uh, from the negatives to, uh, to some positives. But we do think that the industry is in a situation today that is probably unique, maybe unique in the last century with all of the, uh, the races, uh, technologies coming into play right at the time when we have this, uh, this pandemic and the reduction in capital available for innovation and so on. And you can see here, this is just, this is early numbers of the reductions that people have put in R&D and CapEx. Now, the, you know, the, the issue here is, what's this gonna mean? Um, particularly, what does it mean for the races um, uh, trends? What's it mean for the, the pace of techno technological change? And what does it mean for individual suppliers? And how do you m make more with less in an environment where there isn't as much sales, profitability has gone down, there just aren't as many dollars to go around, and, and many of the suppliers in, are in distress. Well, Tom, if you go to the next slide, um, one, of, one of the things you want to be, if you think about it, going forward, you wanna be in a position where you make critical investments that have a high payback, that you're very efficient in the use of your capital. What this is looking at right here is, it's looking at it across about 516 companies and it's looking at how much they invested, which is the X axis or horizontal axis on this chart. And then the vertical axis is the returns that they got on the, uh, the R&D that they spent. Obviously where you want to be, and this, this covers more than just the auto industry, but what you'd like to be is in the upper left hand or grayed out quadrant that we have here where you're an efficiency hero. You would like to be able to, to think clearly. You have less money to spend. Let's spend it in the right way. Let's spend it in a way that has a really high payback. And about 25% you know, of companies fall into that, uh, that gray area today. And, uh, and, but, but those are the ones that are really outperforming the market. And that would be the objective that you have here. Invest your money smart. But if you do that, it makes a huge difference. Um, as Tom mentioned earlier, this is the time when, when market share shifts really occur. When money becomes constrained, the thoughtfulness about how you invest becomes the key to how you perform going out into the future. And you can see here, coming out of the 2009 uh, you know, Great Recession, there was a real a real difference between those that uh, that came out in an agile way and performed well versus the ones that did not and how they how they performed over time and you can look at this through, through multiple lenses you can look at it from a market share standpoint and there is absolutely no question that that recession was a uh, was a catalyst for real market share changes and we believe that this one will be as well what did those companies that did well do well they they went back from just pure budgeting to much improved and much more sophisticated scenario planning, which we could talk a lot about. They were quick in taking out cost. They lowered their break even point to the worst case scenario. They, uh, they, they zero based what they did. And, uh, and they also ended up being very involved in M&A, which is in some cases counterintuitive because you're short of cash, how do you go out and do an M&A? But doing the smart M&A frequently makes real sense. Go to the next slide, Tom. So, like I said, we think that, uh, that this is a critical in inflection point. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the racist trends are gonna continue. People are gonna have less money. Being really thoughtful is going to matter here. So we do think that there will be consolidation, that that's going to make sense. I'm going to talk about that in a minute in an example. We think that uh, that complexity um, and over specification will need to be cut dramatically. You just can't spend on frivolous things. We think, you know, unfortunately, as you think about the big trends, many of them require platform winners, which means that not everybody's going to be able to win with what we call the new technologies or what will become engine two or the new growth vehicles for many suppliers. So 
if you want to be one of the ones who's a winner, you need to take advantage of that today. You need to think about how to get to scale. We're already seeing the traditional tier structure in the industry begin to erode. OEMs are starting to reach down um, and, and, and develop contracts with what have traditionally been tier two or tier three suppliers. In fact, we've even seen um, OEMs going and trying to negotiate directly with lithium miners to ensure that they have uh, continuity of lithium supply as electric vehicles take off. And then the last trend here is that uh, whereas a lot of the differ differentiation was in hardware in the past, both the vehicle, the engine, and so on and so forth in the future, it's all going to be about the semiconductors and it's going to be about software. Um, next one. So if you are a, uh, a player, supplier today, what do you need to do? We think that probably more than any other time, it's time to revisit your strategy. You've got to protect your core. You've got to select in, and, and invest in some growth areas. The industry is changing. There's gonna be different volumes. There's gonna be electric vehicles. There's gonna be more electronics. Knowing where the growth areas are and selectively investing to play in those are gonna be critical. You're gonna to have to be very smart about how you apply your R&D and your CapEx. You've gotta be very effective and efficient at that. And if you are, you have the opportunity to be one of the winners here. And then finally, of course, there are the no brainer steps that you have to take, which is you have to drive operational and commercial excellence. You've got to be able to take out costs. You've got to be able to zero base the things that you do. Go back to the drawing board and think about if you were starting from scratch, what are the costs that you need? What do you need to do? You also need to be really thinking about the, uh, the muscles that you have commercially because there's many, many new programs, many new platforms coming online, many of them electric. They, uh, they're gonna require a new set of suppliers and how are you gonna play in that field and how are you going to win? Next slide, Tom. One of the ways that we think about this as you think about um, your portfolio of, of components that you provide or products that you provide to the industry is to look at that portfolio and think about, first of all, again on the horizontal axis here how can what is your competitive position we think of this in terms of relative market share relative market share is defined by your market share divided by the market share of the largest player in your category or business so that if you're the leader you would have a relative market share of more than one if there is somebody who's bigger than you in that business you would have a relative market share of less than one and you can see that you can go from a strong position. If your relative market share is 0.8 or greater, it means that you are a leader or a co-leader. Or if you have a relative market share of 0.4 or less, it would mean that you are a, a distant follower. And then the second lens here is to look at the segment attractiveness. How large is it? How much it is, is it going to be growing? What's the profitability of the industry? These are measures of how how attractive this market is now and potentially in the future. And there's a series of actions you would take depending on where your position is. Obviously, if you are in the upper right-hand corner, you want to leverage that position, you wanna drive and defend it at all costs. In the lower left-hand corner you, corner, you might consider divesting. You might consider selling to somebody for whom that product is worth more than it is to you, somebody who could, who could be a leader. Go to the next chart and I'll just share with you a little bit of an example of, of, uh, of this. This is, this is looking at a, a supplier that we have worked closely with over the last couple of years to help them think through these very issues. This is just looking at their sales. They're, they're a large um, OEM supplier, a tier one supplier, and they play in a number of areas. You can see here from, from powertrain to new technology to after sales. And the coloring here is the red are um, components that go into internal combustion engines. The gray are what I will call conventional or classic parts, which means they're on vehicles, whether electric or um, ICE vehicles. And then the green is all about uh, the new technologies, whether it's ADAS or whether it's electrification of the vehicle or electric vehicles. And you can see that, uh, that there's obviously going to be different growth dynamics going into the future. So we worked with this company and then we, we also laid over the, uh, the framework that I just showed, which is their 
relative market share. And what we discovered is that they really had a dog's breakfast of, uh, of, of components in their portfolio. And so we worked with them to take a, a few actions. One was there were a lot of um, their components that are distant followers that they were unlikely to be leaders in and were likely to decline over time. And so we packaged up those into groups of portfolios of components and ended up selling them off in packages. We, uh, we ended up making about four divestitures of significant amounts of components. And then we looked at the other side, which is how do we strengthen our position in some of the ice uh, related components? We said, look, we're strong, we could become stronger and we ought to take a last man standing approach, be the last real supplier in this and let's consolidate it a little bit. And so let's acquire some of the weaker players, consolidate our position and, uh, and become really the, uh, the, the real leader. And, uh, and then also we need, to, we need to invest in some new technologies and strengthen our position there so that we will have the resources to lead in some of the new electrification technologies. That has led to four acquisitions. Um, one of them has been consummated. The other three are scheduled to close in the next couple of months but we'll put them so that their portfolio is about 85% of their component positions will be in leadership positions in their industry. They'll also be extremely well hedged um, looking at uh, the potential decline in ICE as, as the, uh, the ICE vehicles decline, their electric vehicle related components should grow and really provide them a hedge for stability going into the future, which we think makes a, a very sensible strategy for them. Next slide, Tom. So what are the things that we think that suppliers need to be doing now? Well, we think first of all, there are the no-brainer actions that you have to take. You've got to generate as much cash as you can from your current business. You can do that through cost reduction in, in direct and indirect procurement, SG&A. Every single cost needs to be looked at, but you also need to be thinking about capacity and footprint. You've, you've got to look at this R&D and figure out how much you can actually spend and then think about doing it in the most efficient and effective way, very strategic. You've got to then think about uh, how you grow your core business and that gets to what I was talking about in terms of commercial excellence. How are you going to ensure that you are on the platforms that are being developed going forward? How do you penetrate uh, the current OEMs that you have further and how do you get into new OEMs particularly for many companies, it will be around growth areas like China and so on. And then finally, we think almost every company needs to have something in the engine two category, which is what are, gonna be, what are you gonna be your growth um, areas in the future? How are you going to fund those? How are you going to think about some M&A to get the capabilities that you need? Or, or might you do some partnering? These are the three actions that we, we think need to be the, the core set of activities that you need to go through. So I think uh, I'll leave it, leave it there. And uh, uh, thank you very much for listening. And we'll uh, go back to, uh, to Adam and, and Mark and, uh, and happy to answer any questions that you have. Yeah, thanks so much, Mark. And, and um, I, I think it's a really interesting presentation. I think you know, everybody who's viewing right now is, is I'm sure getting a lot of value out of it if, if the, <laughs> the questions are any uh, indication anyway. So we've received quite a few different questions. Um, so I might have to combine them a little bit, but, but one of them, for example, was, um, you know, given all the uncertainty with COVID-19 and everything that's going on right now, basically when is the right time to determine, you know, what your strategy is moving forward? And, and also kind of part two of that question is, you know, given the historically, you know, sometimes slow reaction by, by OEMs or the automotive industry, you know, what do you suggest for companies who are attempting to provide innovative and lower cost solutions to those OEMs? So two questions there. Um, the first one on timing. Um, it, it, you should have started a year ago. <laughs> you know, sh short answer on this is that the, the timing is actually really critical. Right now is, is critically important and here's why. I made the comment that we think that many of these uh, engine two growth platforms are going to be winner take most kinds of things. And so I think that as we, as we see some consolidation, there already is a mad scramble for positions in many of these technologies. 
And if you are late to the party, you, you have the real risk of being left out. And here, you know, here's the issue. Right at the moment, everybody's concerned about, can I get my workers back? Can I, can I get production going? Can I, can I, uh, you know, can I follow through? Can I get, can I get product even out the door? What, how's my supply chain working? And as you're dealing with all of these very, very urgent issues, the tendency is to not look at the long term. And yet, right now is the time to actually look at that because if, if you are left out, you will be an underperformer. There's really no question about that. And then the second one is resources are constrained. And so being very smart about this is, is really critical. And it, it, you know, in the, in the case example that I gave, uh, you know, we ended up making some divestitures. Those packaging up those parts that were not going to be winners for us in the future was a really critical element of generating cash, in addition to all of the operational things that need to be done. So, Tom, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think this uh, this this answers the question uh, very well. I think what what I would maybe add is um, about the timing. You know, I mean, if you look at the space, um, everybody is starting to make their bets right now, and and there's a lot of M and A opportunity going on and and M and A activity going on right now. Um, so yeah, the right time is is really now. If you haven't already started, um, I think you should now. Great. Yeah, and then um, a follow up question to that are, you know, what successful models are you seeing for corporates in general? And for suppliers who are specifically trying to engage with early stage innovation or potentially the startup ecosystem. Yeah, great, great question. I think, um, I mean, <laughs> first, first question here or first answer here is um, probably should we continue to do that and should we continue to engage with early stage startups and and you know the clear answer here is um, yes, we should um, because the the pace of innovation is is so fast and and you know you really want to have your eyes and ears um, out there in in the innovation ecosystem and see what's going on. Um, and then secondly, also you want to be seen um, as a trusted and reliable partner. So you know many many uh, corporates typical corporate behavior is. Um, when it comes to budget cuts, first thing we are cutting is our innovation activities in Silicon Valley, our corporate venture funds, and and this is this is such a tight community um, that you know that that doesn't go well with the community. So you really want to be seen as a as a strong and consistent partner here. Um, what 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 you know interesting and successful models are, is I think there is a bunch of models. Um, people are, are using and applying, you know, um, there's obviously corporate venture uh, models, um, which is interesting um, to really look beyond the horizon, have eyes and ears out there and get, get, into, get into and see new innovation technologies early, earlier than your competitor does, right? Um, and then there is on the other side um, of the spectrum is, is more like a, a closer to the core business approach, which is, which is kind of a venture client platform model, um, for example, BMW, um, Startup Garage. So we really have a predefined problem, white spot in technology, and you're going out there and you're looking for startups who can help you fill this. You can bring in those startups um, to set up partnerships immediately, which, which optimize your, your products right now. So there's a, there's a whole bandwidth. Um, I think important to mention here is that uh, it's hard to do all those things alone. And that's why, you know, such a model like plug and play, um, I think is a great model to, to really um, be engaged in, in, in this community and, and just have somebody who is, uh, who is reputation help you, um, you know, be, be a good part and member of this community. Great. Yeah, and I think, you know, I'm being cognizant of the time, so maybe just one more question, um, which is you, you spoke about M&A activity in order to strengthen positioning in the market for a supplier. But can you talk about maybe some of the larger mergers that are going on, like FCA and PSA, for example, at the OEM level, and if you see need for more to occur in order to maintain stability in the industry? So, short answer to that is, for stability in the industry, there really should be some consolidation that goes on. We see in the FCA and the PSA um, merger and the, uh, the regulatory issues associated with that, how how tricky that really is actually to happen because most uh, most countries, if they have a, 
an automotive capability, view it as a national asset. And so there are some real challenges to making it happen. Um, short answer is, I think we will see um, some of this going on. One place in particular where that is likely to be the case is in China, where there are really too many um, car makers uh, that have developed in that market. That needs to be consolidated. And the industry in general should be consolidated. It particularly, some of the, one of the places you see the particular weakness is in countries that don't have their own indigenous um, you know, vehicle manufacturing. So you take a, a market like Argentina that has a sales of about 400,000 vehicles, but has 17 uh, different automotive makers selling vehicles in the market. Makes it very, very tricky. So short answer is yes, it should happen. There are some significant barriers and therefore it's very difficult to predict which ones will actually come to, come to pass at this point. Okay. Maybe just adding um, quickly that, you know, this is exactly the reason why we're also seeing many more loose partnerships going on, like, you know, VW and Ford, I mean, as, as the latest example, I think this is, this is what we might see in an increasing uh, level to, to really see people partner um, on new technology platforms to really uh, share um, and, and get to increased scale here. Absolutely. Okay, um, you know, I, again, I'm cognizant of the time. I wanna make sure that we can get to the startups. We do have quite a few unanswered questions. So if it's all right with you guys, maybe I'll put a couple people in touch with you or maybe they can continue this conversation. Um, yep. But yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. I think it's been great. And, you know, I'd like to hand it over to Mark to introduce some of our startups.